Warning, the following podcast features views and opinions that are likely to trigger the extreme fanboys and fangirls who disagree with them. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome everybody to another episode. This is one I've been looking forward to probably since the beginning because I feel like I'm very much in the minority today. But I have one of my favorite people with me. It's like our morning talks, but now in a podcast. It's Roth Cornett. Hi, this is our morning talks. I'm excited because this is a conversation I think we almost did have in the car. I feel Um, like we've danced around this, but we're like, this is for another time. (laughs) And now the time has come. Uh, So a little bit of context. Uh, This was around the end of season six, season seven. Steve Carell had announced he was not coming back for uh, season eight of The Office, that season seven would be the end. Uh, And really, once that was announced, I feel like the anticipation people had for season eight just dropped exponentially. Mm. Do you remember kind of when that announcement was made? I do, and I I think you've probably had a more recent rewatch of of these seasons than I have, so I'm I'm drawing largely on memory. Um, But... My story with The Office is actually I seriously doubted the U.S. office because I had watched the British one like a jerk first. Of course. and Right, because like, <laughs> oh, it's not going to be as good as it's a BBC. It's not going to be the British oh, humor blah, blah, blah. that I expect. And then what was so cool about it, because it, David Brent is so British, and what they found was that the, the office like became a franchise. So there was like a French office and U.S., and every single country that it was in represented the ethos of the workplace kind of in that country and also right. the humor. So there was something so sweet and endearing about the buffoonery of Michael Scott and how dumb he is, but how well-intentioned. That's so American. And I feel like that, like capturing the pure ethos of like the United States workplace experience did go with him. Which I would think after, especially after watching it, I I watch The Office all the way through at least twice a year. Uh, it is just, it's that, it's like that show that doesn't get old for me, but I feel like those first, I think the first season's only like six episodes or five episodes. Yeah. And I feel like they didn't, they were trying to adapt the British way of doing it. And it wasn't until the second season when they really kicked off because Michael's a little mean spirited in those first ones. He is. And I think that you're right. They found their footing and they obviously there's far fewer episodes of the British office because they just operate differently. The BBC does than the US, which is both good and bad because we had more time to get to know Michael. We had they had more time to develop him as a character to to realize we wanted to empath if he was going to be the center of the show, we would have to empathize with him to some degree even when he's being ridiculous yeah and even then like he, they gave him so much heart i really feel like the moment that i was like all right michael's actually a really good guy do you remember that episode very early on where uh it's like bring your daughter to work day and he shows that video of him <laughs> yeah. as a kid and it's so sad like <laughs> oh my god yeah you feel for michael so i i do understand a for a lot of people, The Office is Michael Scott. Yeah. That's the show. So uh, fast forward to season seven, when you knew the time was up, I think a lot of people, in fact, we just had our, our camera guy, uh, Handsome, Ryan Elliott, and the other day he was talking about how he's like, yeah, I just stopped watching like season seven. I feel like a lot of people drop off at yeah. season seven, especially on rewatches. You get to Goodbye Michael, which is maybe one of the best episodes of that entire series. And it acts like a series finale. And I guess you could stop there. But I I think some of the best office is still to come. Well, I think there's some really good office to come. And I think that they ended up closing it out very well, um, given the circumstances. But uh, we'll we'll talk about the character specifically. So the office for me was Michael. and, And I loved all the characters, but it was really also Jim and Pam. And so I think the first season after Michael, I think they were struggling to find their way in a number of respects, which we'll talk about. Um, Robert California came in, and he's a great character, but he kind of pulled focus away from the other characters, and they lost their way with their core team. And it just became about this wacky, zany guy who represented this other part of American industry (laughs) where he was pure machismo and crazy, you know, and bravado. Um, 
And he represented like the challenges of being a boss in another way. Because Michael always, he just wanted to be their friend, but he right. also had to be their manager and he never knew how to do it, which was why he hated Toby. Um, <laughs> but, like, Toby was like, you can't do both. Um, but, and Robert California was just like, he was just like human jizz. Can I say that on your podcast? Uh, you did. I just so. did. You know what I mean? <laughs> if like, I bleep <laughs> it, people are going to be like, what was that? Human what? <laughs> like he was just pure, like just, he was just man and male and bravado and like, but then he was also bananas, like right. bat crazy. But which you don't really get until Later. halfway through that season where you start to realize like, oh, this guy isn't just like yeah. super machismo. He's also like a little off, a little <laughs> off center. But the th okay, so at the end, they had that kind of interesting, it, 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 loses, uh, it loses steam with me each rewatch, but they had those kind of interesting episodes with Will Ferrell mm -hmm. uh, where he was, and then all summer long, we were like, who's going to take over? And then it was Andy, which makes sense because Ed Helms at that time was probably the biggest mm -hmm. star mm -hmm. uh, coming out of The Hangover. The thing that I do like, I, I really like Andy as a manager for 90% of season eight. Like, let's just take it season by season right now. There's season eight and season nine. Yeah. Season eight, 90% of that I really like because the thing about Michael was he's a very insecure person yeah but it's very internalized so all of his outward motions and everything that he does are coming from a base of insecurity but even an insecurity i don't think that he's willing to admit to himself it's no, this yeah. delusional insecurity i really liked the reverse of andy where he was outwardly insecure like i don't know what i'm doing which is something michael would really never say mm -hmm. and i felt like that gave the other characters something, A, something else to do, which was to kind of support uh, this manager. But it also gave Andy, like, another layer because they knew that they had to kind of pump the brakes a little bit after season three where it was like, whoa, this guy is, like, hated. Yeah, well, I think th the thing with Andy is, to me, he was represented how lost the show would become. Andy, for me, is the pinnacle of where the office writers get lost because he was always a plot device, always, always a plot device. And as much as he, we would learn to love him or we would learn to hate him or whatever it was, he was the foil for Dwight, for Jim at first. And then and then he was like really heinous and we hated him. And then they wanted to give him some humanity and then they made him completely heinous again. It was psychotic. It was schizophrenic. And a lot of it was just logistical because Ed Helms scheduling pro had scheduling right. problems, which I think speaks to some of the problems in season nine. They were just logistical problems. Um, and then there's also like, there was the backdoor pilot for the farm, which was Oof. the Dwight Schrute spinoff. I love me the office. That is the <laughs> one episode every time that I skip. Yeah, it I is mean, terrible. It's terrible, but it also speaks to they didn't know how to close Dwight out until they right. were midway through that season, and it was the same thing with Andy. And it was just like I felt like their characters were getting, and it wasn't anyone's fault, but so lost and mistreated. And the most egregious case for me was the office is Michael. But right next to that is the office's Jim and Pant. Mm. They are, to me, the best written couple ever on television, sustained on television, because the relationship is so real, it's so natural, but it's also kind of epic. And it's not that I minded that they had problems, but their problems were dumb problems that that couple wouldn't have. Their problem, okay, so... I both agree and disagree with you about the gym because I know that you have not liked the season nine gym and Pam. Thing. I did not like it. Based on your old Screw IGN reviews, you. you are very <laughs> upset. Which, by the way, I used to read your old IGN office reviews. That's amazing. And yeah. I had to go back and look at some of them. And boy, I was very self-serious. I mean, the office is no <laughs> joke when it comes to you. But here's what I think. I don't think the core conflict of two people who really had this like fever pitch kind of romance that that was almost too fairy tale. I don't think it's unrealistic that there comes a point where they each want something different, but that doesn't mean that they don't want each other. But that wasn't the problem I had with the show. It wasn't, I, I actually liked when they would introduce, and by the way, when I was saying screw you, it wasn't you. I was saying screw you to Brian, the boom guy of no freaking where. Um, <laughs> that was my problem was when they would have very realistic couple problems i actually thought the show was like 
at its best Mm -hmm. um, because they were allowing Jim and Pam to still be very human, very real people we root for. They're having normal everyday couple problems and lives. um, And then they see their way through where I didn't, I thought they were being very manipulative when they broke the, the, when they brought Brian forward Mm. Um, because it didn't pay off. It never went anywhere. If that's such a big deal on that show, it should have felt massive. And instead it was this fake out to make you think that maybe there was going to be like a, a love triangle with Jim and Pam again like there was initially with Roy um, it was just dumb and it didn't go anywhere I thought that's where they failed me as a viewer it's not anything that would even come remotely cl- you never think of those two people of people that would even think about cheating they just wouldn't right no it was that is it was strange because I feel like the big takeaway from that was like Pam is confiding in another, not even another man, another person. And I think that's what Jim initially gets upset about. Like you cried in front of Brian. Whereas they set it up, like maybe they just put the tropes in there as if it was going to be a love triangle, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't. But I think the core conflict made sense to me. The only thing that has ever felt weird about that, and I was thinking about this last night, was... I feel like this storyline could have benefited so much if we had started the season in the middle of it. I think if you mm-hmm. had introduced this at like the cliffhanger that Jim was like, by the way, I did this business thing. But we come into season nine and that first episode, it's it's one of the only times in the office where I kind of cringe where <laughs> Jenna Fisher is like, nope, it's just a boring old lives. I don't think anything else is going to happen. And I'm like, oh, don't, don't set it up like that. Of course we know something's going to happen. But imagine if you had started season nine on that on that note, like, Things have been a little weird. Jim kind of, you know, he took that, he did do that Philly thing, and now he's trying to split his time. Like, if you started the season, I feel like it would have maybe, I don't know, maybe it would have felt a little more organic rather than like, oh, here's our big season-long arc of our relationship. Yeah, it feels like a lot of their characters and the ones that we really cared about. I mean, a lot of the characters, like Creed's just, hey, like, we don't need to know that much about Creed. We, We should never know that much about Creed. Um, but a lot of their characters felt to me like the main ones got very lot. They didn't know what to do with them. They kept throwing in other characters, trying to test the chemistry, trying to recapture some of that Michael magic. And it just felt really, really, uh, uh, disorganized. They, they, they didn't know where they wanted to go. It was problem after problem with, with the people that I cared most about on the show and the people that were served the best. Um, were like Angela and Oscar, which I thought were very well served. They actually had really good arcs, those final, especially that final season. With the senator. With the senator, and then kind of becoming aligned and having this. I thought they actually had one of the better arcs of the season, but it was disappointing. And I get it. Like, Andy, you know, that's a scheduling issue. You think you're going to do this other show with Dwight, so you don't want to have him you want to have him separated from the rest of the of the team all of these things make sense but they made for a really disjointed season of television and the only the thing that most people pointed to just because maybe they weren't unpack like thinking about all that was michael's not here so it sucks right which again too like so i can i totally understand where you're coming from where it's like everything's in a little bit of a disarray and it's like one week these two characters like there was that weird period of time i mean this was before michael even left but like where dwight and ryan were teaming up and then dwight is off with daryl for a little bit but again i think when you look at the office as a whole like Sometimes I don't think of The Office in terms of story or even in terms of an episode. I think in terms of moments, whereas like there are funny mo- like moments that stick with me that I can't remember. And the Russo brothers, when they talked about uh, Avengers Infinity War, they came up with this thing called Strange Alchemy, which was two characters you really wanted to see together who otherwise would never be together. Right. Uh, and I just thinking about some of the crazier, like what, why are some of actually my favorite moments when Dwight is trying to get Daryl in shape and he's like, what do you want? I want to look good for Wa- uh, for Val. Val Kilmer? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like there's some really good like humor that comes out of it. The Toby, um, uh, what's her name? Oh, uh, 
I know you're talking about when he was. Uh, Why am I blanking yeah, on her name? I know who you're talking about. Well, anyway, well, yes, you know who we're talking about. I, uh, you, obviously, you have to. Uh, Nelly. Yes, uh, Nelly, Nelly and Toby. Yeah. Like. The, again, just like that weird, People strange. People hated Nelly. I don't understand. Why. I didn't hate Nelly. I liked Nelly actually. Nelly was just another uh, ingredient. I, I guess you could say like she started very uh, at a ten, yeah. And by the end of the series, she was a little bit more humanized. But you could say that about almost any of the characters. That's true, except yeah. for Jim and Pam. Jim and Pam always started as human beings. Always, always. Every other character on the show was edging on a caricature. Almost, they were dancing that line the entire series. But Dwight, to me, actually has one of... He's one of my favorite characters on the show, period, because they the fact that they were able to ever humanize Dwight, which they did, and pretty successfully, but not change the core of who he was, which is ridiculous and kind of an asshole. Um, I mean, he's an asshole. I mean, he is. He's yeah, an asshole. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But he's like, Angela's asshole. You know, they deserve each other, and, and they they match. And But... but it was the psychotic nature of the schizo what felt to me like the schizophrenic nature of of those final two seasons where they they did it felt like they had lost their center um at, in the writer's room and didn't know how to recover and they were trying and trying and trying to figure out which you can't blame anybody for that and it did lead to some bum moments if you think about game of thrones it's the same thing it's like right. oh look it's Arya and whoever this week the hound i just I, I mean maybe i'm giving season eight too much credit but up until the, I think it's the second to last where they do the fundraiser. Mm -hmm. I feel like the fundraiser episode where Andy has just been fired from Dunder Mifflin. That's yeah. those last two episodes. It's like, where are we going here for just a sec? But everything up until then, like I, I see where it's going and I like that idea of it. I think the stuff with like the Tallahassee little storyline, oh everything in Tallahassee <laughs> so is insane. perfect. That's like everything <laughs> great about Dwight. Uh, it's everything great about, uh, I loved like that weird, like that's the way you do a, a, a I don't know, why do I want to say triple threat? Triangle. Yeah, That's how you do love triangle yeah, 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 is you, yeah. you shoot that girl in there. And she was yeah. great. And then the next episode, she was such a catty bitch at the, oh, I just always get myself in trouble with bloggers. <laughs> you know? Like there's really good stuff. I will agree though that season nine, yeah, season nine is, is look, there's still a lot that I like in season nine, but season nine is much less structured than season eight. And maybe that's it is season nine is really the one that I think about when mm. I think about the end of The Office, because it wasn't necessarily for me that I said The Office couldn't sustain without Michael Scott. It just didn't in that season, and it wasn't because Michael was, wasn't was there. It's just that that season was incredibly messy. It just wasn't good until the very end where they managed to, and to their credit, pull it together enough to deliver, I thought, a great finale um, where Michael was in just a little bit and just as much as he needed to be in order to kind of say, I haven't been here for two years, so this is really your moment. I had mine right. with Goodbye Michael, right? So... I thought all of that was really well done, but it wasn't a good season in my mind for at least half of that season nine. It was very messy. Again, there's lots of reasons why, but yeah, my problem wasn't, I think Michael is the office. And then after that, I think those characters are the office. So if all of them are being mistreated, then you have no office anymore. I think, but I think only to me, only Andy is the one that's like the big problem of season He's a nine. Huge problem, and it, and it is because you should never be in a position where the lead of your show leaves for eight episodes, yeah. and you're like. Uh, Good. Yeah. yeah. Like you almost feel the same amount of dread that the workers do that yeah. episode. He comes back, you know? But, but the other thing too, is that I think you're right, is that they were leaning into Ed Helms, who in the reality of that world worked much better as just a support player. Right. I think. Um, and then, but he was their biggest star. Right. So they were, I don't necessarily think they were writing to what made sense um, for the show. Uh, which it, it could have been interesting to have the show be entirely rudderless in order, like Dunder, not the show, the show was rudderless. Right. The Dunder Mifflin be rudderless and managerless for a period of time. Imagine the Game of Thrones of The Office. Imagine the power plays between all of them happening at once. Like that would have been really fun to watch. And then you don't really need a Robert Keller. You don't like need these other characters. Let them go at it. The people that we already like. I Yeah. It's very strange how his character 
evolved over like he came back and he was so mean he was awful like i don't know what happened like but he ne- like even by the end by that uh series finale there doesn't even seem to be a ton of remorse yeah. from that character like i wish i would have done some things differently it's just like Okay, well, I got like I guess the writers thought that they got embarrassed enough from that singing show that, but I don't know. But I do think that, by the way, that Andy has the best line in the whole series finale. Yeah, yeah like, it is a great. I line. wish I wish someone would tell you you're in the good old days before you left them. That's that's a that's a great freaking line. But I, it's like oh, uh, all right. But I, the asshole said it. Yeah, yeah, yeah the it, worst. It, the worst. He. And part of me like kind of wonders, I don't know if this is true at all or not, um, but if they were kind of mad at Ed Helms, you know, and it just came out in the writing of that character because they made him irredeemable, you know, and he had been very redeemed and we loved him. Like you, you loved Andy for a period of time, right? right. Like he totally. Season eight, Andy, season eight. I think that you, you really liked him. Yeah, he totally had our empathy. And then they just made him unbearable. And so it's almost like, do you hate it with Helms? Or like, <laughs> what's going on? Yeah, it's, I have to think that they like clued Ed, like, here's kind of what your character's going to be doing. And I don't know if it was just like, all right, whatever. Like, I'm really busy I'm also, being yeah. famous right now. Which, that didn't pan out either. No. Like, both those projects were slightly underserved in terms of like what he brought to it. Yeah. But, he did um, not do the Michael J. Fox and, no. and do kill it on the show and the movie. No. Or as I like to say, the Tim Allen with the number one book, movie and TV show all at the same time. Was it the Santa Claus? Santa Claus. And then Home, and Home Improvement. Improvement. And, and was Don't the Stand Too Close to a Naked Man. Good advice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the book sells itself. Uh, I do think like... One character who did well. Here's the thing with Michael Scott leaving. Uh, I I think you're right. I think, well, Michael's not on the show. It's just a very like succinct, easy way to sum up. Like there are things I like and things I don't like about these seasons. You're yeah. just like, oh, Michael's gone. It it went downhill. It's an easy way to say it. But I do think that there are some characters who did benefit and i think like dwight is one of those characters that benefited really because he's the only one throughout the entire show that has like a complete fulfilling organic believable arc i agree uh and i don't know if that it was even possible when michael was there because that his role was to support michael yeah, I think that's true. Is as long as you have Michael, then so Dwight. Do you know those fish that swim along whales, and sure. like that like coast <laughs> along with them, and they kind of like ride their wave. Dwight Michael was that for Dwight, and so he was always just going to be kind of sidelined and riding that wave. But if there is a power vacuum, then Dwight gets to emerge, and he gets to kind of like test out. Well, do I want to? lend my loyalties here do i want to go for my own thing like he was just i agree he he benefited probably the most out of any of the characters and he has one of my favorite arcs i love dwight um he's a great character so well written they i think they again mistreated him in the final season a little bit because they were planning to do a different show and that's no one's fault it's just annoying to watch (laughs) But one of the things that like I really point to is like I love to see finally the evolution of him and Jim's friendship yeah. to, to like a true friendship. Yeah. Uh, that by the end it's it's like it's so heartbreaking that they're not going to be together again. But that scene in the office, or you know, at the yeah, very yeah. end where he's like, no, 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 don't don't quit. Yeah. I'm firing you so you can get the severance. Like it's yeah. not something Dwight season four would do no you know? and, yeah you're right and i i agree i love dwight and jim and pam because mm-hmm. it was even before before uh i feel like and maybe i'm misremembering this correct me if i'm wrong i feel like there were moments before jim could even allow any sympathy or empathy for dwight that pam did that pam would always kind of like she would go along with jim because dwight's so annoying and it's funny and then she would hit up this against a moment here and there where she she would align with Dwight or she would feel bad for Dwight and she would have sympathy for him. Um, and she, I think the door opened for her first. And then imagine this person that you freaking hate more than anything. And you've just gone through so much together that you're bonded. And that's what happened for them. But I think Jim would probably also be happy not to work with him anymore. Oh, I mean, like one <laughs> of my favorite episodes, season eight, is Dwight 
doesn't realize he's about to walk in to get fired for that Tallahassee store. And Jim literally has to wrestle him. Yeah. But because Pam was like, you can't let him do this. He's like, I tried. She's like, did you really try? Yeah. And he literally wrestles him to the ground. And just at the end when Dwight realizes like, yep, he saved me. And they, they don't acknowledge it. They just yeah. kind of you know, nod with each other and walk out. Like that's, that's the, that's the heart. There's so much heart in these seasons, even when maybe it's a little bit of a mess that I don't feel like it's worth just like not watching it. No, I don't think so either. I just think you have to watch it with a grain of salt, you know? And I feel like it has, it's not, this isn't, this is like, not Breaking Bad, you know, this isn't right. like the creators knew exactly what they were doing and blah, 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 whether you like it or whether you don't. This is a show that you have to have, oh, I think you have to watch it with the knowledge of what was kind of going on behind the scenes and how challenging that must have been for them. And I don't think they really had a good contingency plan for losing Michael Scott. And they just kept trying to replace Michael Scott, which you can't do. Um, I think they're really messy seasons, but there's great moments in them. And I still love those characters, which is why when they, especially Pam and Jim, and you know this, that's where I was like, F you. Like this to me, you you have created something so incredible, which is every other show where there's, there's a will they or won't they, that relationship is boring, done, the characters are done after that. That never happened with Jim and Pam. Right. Well, we got to see them actually grow as a couple. We yeah. got to see the engagement, the wedding, the first baby, the second baby. Yeah. Uh, and then all the, the fights that came in season nine. All of, of which is fine. Just don't throw in a fake will they or won't they. That pissed me off. That really, it really, really, I, I felt burned. But it, it like... It's also one of those things where, like, I don't, I don't know how often you revisit The Office or how if you've even watched some of those episodes since they aired. I haven't, but maybe I should. But it's one of those things where it's like I feel like maybe it's such a bigger sticking point in your mind when actually you watch it. It's like a moment. It's like three. It's three episodes out of twenty-four of yeah. a season, you know. But I feel like it's that. I don't know if you've had this moment in a friendship or whatever where it's like something happens, some offense happens where in reality, it's not that big a deal, but for whatever reason, it's your exact button right. at that moment <laughs> and you let it go. But you're like, yeah, but you remember that one time <laughs> I'll forget with the diet Coke, but I don't forget <laughs> uh, Like that's that moment. And I don't know why it is such a sticking point because I think that what they, they, it's almost perfect. Yeah, well, it also, you said, like, you were, it should have been this huge thing that we broke this yeah, illusion. Yeah, and then it was, like, nothing. Well, it also, like, I never thought, and I, I always think, because I'm one of those people that still watches Modern Family, and I'm like, are they ever going to address, or are we just supposed to forget after time that, like, they're talking to somebody? Yeah. Uh, I was I was genuinely surprised that they, like, acknowledged, like, we always kind of knew that they were filming something, but after a while, you just forget about it. Yeah. Uh, and you shouldn't be reminded, because why are they there nine years on? Yeah. Well, <laughs> here's, the th here's the thing I will give you for, like... I don't think that like when Brian comes in, it, it becomes this like massive storyline, but it does make you think about logistical things mm -hmm. that you probably shouldn't have. Like mm -hmm. they even say this, they're, they're like, okay, so we're watching them all throughout the ad start airing. And then we see them at poor Richards watching the documentary. Mm -hmm. It's like, but why are you still why? filming this? It's 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 airing. It's, yeah. They even have to say at the beginning where he's like, "Oh, I guess you're doing a reunion." Uh, they're like, "Yeah, we're gonna put this on the DVD for sure." But it's like, okay, I buy that. But then what about those four or five episodes at the tail end of this season that clearly you guys were just there? Like, yeah, it, that was one of my problems with it. It was it was. <sighs> You're nailing why I hate that moment. I hate it so much on so many levels. One, I thought it was a betrayal of uh, our intelligence as an audience that we understand who these characters are and what they will or won't do. Like, obviously, there's not going to be a love triangle. So why freaking tease it? It's so it's so pandering. You know, you're just trying to create drama, but it's not really there. You're abusing the characters. And also, you're reminding me that these people are here nine years later, which is so dumb. Right. And now I don't want to think about that but now i am thinking about it and then you have to like 
ham-fistedly address it. It was just so poorly handled in every way. It never plays out again. Then, then bring them into the world and and open up that door. You like that's actually an interesting storyline, right? But they didn't do that. They didn't do anything with it. It was just another moment of throwing things at the wall to see what would stick. And it's like you want when you really think a show is great, which The Office was. You want to believe that the creators have it in hand. And then the other half of you is like, oh, that's like really hard to do, <laughs> you know? <laughs> For nine For seasons. nine seasons yeah. with 20 plus episodes a season, I certainly couldn't <laughs> come even close. Right. And that's when you're like, all of the logistical things and all of those things, you, they do play in. And the fact that they were able to do it as well as they were is kind of amazing. Yeah, and you also have to remember, too, like, at the time, it didn't pan out for a lot of them, but, like, Jenna Fisher was doing, you know, that Blades of Glory movie, yeah. and Dwight did uh, that where he was, like, the Uncle Rockstar, oh, and yeah. Jim did the uh, Robin Williams, Mandy Moore movie. Now. But they were all, like, they were, they had almost outgrown the show yeah and the show was just trying to hang on yeah for just a little bit longer but yeah look the the brian thing it just makes you think about a lot of like logistical things that you probably shouldn't be thinking of but i i do wonder like do you think they maybe had something more planned and then either got cold feet or it just wasn't well received or well i mean shows definitely have i don't know if they would have had time but maybe they had time to respond because shows do have time to respond sometimes when an audience is not liking something or when they are liking something a lot to adjust the storyline accordingly. So it could have been that the audience rebelled and then they made a shift and good um, because it just wasn't working. That said, one thing that I would like to see in one of these shows is an evolution for like where a season or two they're shooting it. And then it airs as if they're making Jersey Shore. And then the people start to change because they're on television now. Right. Like, wouldn't that be an interesting? Why has no one done that? I'm off topic, but it just <laughs> no, no, occurred no. to I me. I mean, I think that was that's, that's kind of what they were trying to pull off a little bit in the finale. Yeah. With, but also, like, it was such a small scale documentary like it yeah. wasn't like a jersey shore yeah. where those people do change yeah they do change a lot like and i think if you watch any reality show like a jersey shore watch season one and then watch season five and see how different they are because you can tell they've been catered to and they're famous now yeah yeah, yeah. wouldn't that be interesting like to me if you had something like the office where imagine it was those same characters michael scott famous yeah, that's that's definitely like a oh it's bummer. It's a different show. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like it's again it's like you don't think about that if they hadn't introduced the fact that this is what it was. Yeah. Which I guess look, I I'm not begrudging them the fact like uh, they I believe they said way up front in this show like this is a documentary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I don't begrudge them for following through. I guess like again, I go back to like I haven't watched it in a while, but like, I don't, I think Parks and Rec, did they ever really? I don't think they ever did. Yeah. I think they just did it documentary style and then never addressed it. Um, and Modern Family, I don't know what they're going to do with that either. That'd be interesting. But yeah, one of these should probably just be like, well, if it was really three years, at that point, something would be air. Because a documentary might come back every year and check in for nine years and then compile something if you wanted to do kind of like a professorial look at office <laughs> right, ex workplace yeah. experience but they wouldn't be with them every day for nine years and not be airing anything who's paying for that what grant is this i have so many questions <laughs> pbs does not <laughs> you know have the I funding mean, like, to do a nine year deep dive in scranton can PA. you imagine the next show i want to see is the editor having a nervous breakdown that has to try and put oh together my God. The I, I i was thinking that too because when they watch the documentary of poor richards the first thing is like that conversation i'm like what would it look like to condense all nine <laughs> yeah. of these seasons down into a four night special yeah. that's got to be like incomprehensible at a yeah. certain point you just see somebody banging their head against a wall and <laughs> bleeding from their ears hopefully kevin i don't like kevin at <laughs> oh, all kevin i do not like it that's one character where they went the opposite yeah. they started at a two yeah. and he ended at a 14 and a half and yeah. i was just not having it who are your favorite um, kind of like the the side characters? The ancillaries. The ancillaries. Um, I 
feel like I relate to Stanley the most. <laughs> so I'm ha- working with you accurate. <laughs> yeah. I, I love Stanley. And oddly enough, I don't know why I like this character, but I always loved David Wallace. David Wallace was kind of a great character because he came in and he was like, he had a cool arc too because he was like the adult in the room right. always. And then you see what happens to the adult in the room when they lose the adult things, like the livelihood. <laughs> you, you get know? suck it. <laughs> yeah, you get suck it. Like he, but it wasn't, to me, it never felt fake. It was like, yeah, that person's having a total life crisis and right. identity crisis and they're maybe a little crazy right now, but that could happen. Yeah, he's cool. I like Creed, I think, is my favorite. He's just so yeah. creepy and like insane. And Creed is what I wish they had done with Kevin, where they just use Creed enough that yeah. it's still funny. They don't go overboard. They don't give him really any storylines. Yeah. He's just there to say his one or two, two weird things. And then leave. And then he's out. Yeah. And you're, you always wonder if Creed really works there. Right. Like you strongly <laughs> suspect that he never did. Well, he doesn't know what his job title <laughs> well, is. Well, nobody knows. He, nobody. But he also is like determined to keep it going. I, I also have an affection for Phyllis. Phyllis is. An, it, it, this is one where she kind of sometimes has the Andy thing. Nowhere near as bad. But sometimes she is just the worst bitch on the face of the planet. Yeah. She is so sassy and mean. But then. Anytime she's with like Angela, you just your heart <laughs> breaks because Angela's so mean to her. Angela is so mean. Angela's a really interesting character too because she we should just hate her, and a lot of times you do because right. um, she's horrible. But then she'll pop in and be a human being. Um, she also loves cats, which endears well, me to her. They, I mean, they did a lot of triage on her that yeah, last yeah, season. To I mean, they did it to a lot of people in that last season they're like how do we make these people now that we're wrapping it up believable and humanize them because we have to feel like we're going to miss every single person once we're gone so when i went back and looked at what i i went back and actually looked at some of my old reviews i'm like what did i think um with angela i feel like my big takeaway was that they had done a pretty good job because they gave her some humility Mm -hmm. um after her relationship ended and the thing that they did that i thought was weird is make her now suddenly because she was divorced destitute where it's like which didn't make sense because it's like wait a minute she was supporting herself just fine on that same salary and that same job before so even if she lost the the husband why is that so radically changed unless he's taking her money somehow you know these are expensive man okay it was a little bit much it was it It was was a bit much it was a lot much but (laughs) but it was like it was like a necessary evil yeah, at that yeah. point. Like you had to bring her to rock bottom so yeah. that you wanted to see her come back a little bit. Yeah. We um, needed to empathize a little bit because she was so heinous. I also really liked, and they made this decision really early on, but I really liked that they were like, let's just make Ryan really weird. Yeah. Like, let's just make him so out there. I love when he's trying to win Kelly back and he comes out on that horse. Yeah. And Pam's like, so, boo. <laughs> so nuts. Kelly, I may leave you tomorrow. I don't know. We weren't <laughs> meant to be in monogamous relationships, but I want to try. Like, he's such a great character when they let him loose. Yeah. And he also, he was. I think he's a character that could have felt like Andy where he was just a plot device because his behavior is so erratic over the seasons, um, depending on the situation that like, I thought it was an interesting turn to have him be this intern that then isn't all has all this power, but then doesn't know what to do with it and melts down um, and has no real ideas because he's so young and stupid and all of that tracked for me. But then he does go completely bonkers. Um, he, it is the opposite trajectory. Like everybody else is getting more and more human and he's just getting more insane, but I still love, it worked with him. I really thought at that season three ending, that was like a joke. I didn't realize when we picked up season four, he was going to be the guy. The guy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but there you have it. I also really like the addition of Aaron and Gabe. Those are two I great characters. Aaron. That came around, uh, and I really, asso- even though I think Michael was still there when they both were there, I associate them more with, like, back half of The Office. Yeah, Aaron, for some reason, I don't, did Gabe, Gabe came in. Gabe came in when Saber bought them, yeah, yeah. so that would be around that, season six. Yeah, and Aaron came in when Pam got off the reception desk. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, I Aaron's one of my favorites, but it's just because I love her. 
how do you not love her? I mean, she was, she was really great. I feel like she was, she suffered the most from them not knowing what to do with Andy yeah. because they stuck her with that guy whose name I still don't I remember. remember. I, I remember Who his cares? nickname was Plop, but yeah. I don't remember what his real name was. I don't either. He, he was a charisma black hole. Yeah. And they were like, new Jim. And that was the joke in the show. I'm like, no, no, no. no. Clark and Plop. Yeah. yeah. Clark. I thought Clark Duke got a little unfairly um, aligned with Plop. Because he wasn't as bad. Right. Um, I thought Plop was useless. I can't even see his face if I tried to pull it up right now. Um, but Clark Duke wasn't bad. It was just like another thing that was like, why is this here? What's going on? What are you doing? You know? They gave him some good stuff with like Dwight. Uh, yeah. One of my favorite episodes of The Office was the one where they have to uh, put a tranquilizer in Stanley and, and <laughs> <laughs> figure out a way to get him into the car. Oh uh, they gave him some fun stuff to do. But again, that was like a weird period of time too where I feel like – a we as a society decided that Clark Duke was going to be like the uh, next the big thing. thing. And he was in a couple movies that didn't really pan out. And this was like a weird. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was he, he and a, he had Clark and Michael with Michael. Sarah it was a web series, mm. which is even weirder. And then Clark Duke. Yeah. It's just like, he started to emerge as like, Oh, who's this Clark Duke kid. Right. But they also were doing the same. We're, why are you trying to sub in two people to be those characters, represent those characters on the show? Just finish your show like don't you know what I? it was like weird that you know they kept chasing the magic that they had instead of just developing what was already there yeah there's no real need to add them i guess i guess to replace kelly and ryan who had left the show in season nine but it they didn't they didn't match you know the energy didn't match um what can you do? Look, Plop is such a small part of it, and I guess it gave Aaron something to do, but... Not really, though. I mean, she's... But I don't think you needed to manufacture a relationship for Aaron. You know, I I feel like Aaron just being a part of the group and adding her Aaron-ness is enough, you know? And it would just... Like it, see, now you're reminding me why I think it's a total mess. <laughs> You were you like with every character you mentioned, it's like, why did we have them? It was just so dumb and so unnecessary. And like, but then you think of the like Jan with Clark is like, I loved that, that whole episode. Like there's or them getting the suits with the father son. Like, I do think that they were able to bring something to the table. But yeah, look, on the grand scheme of things, I, I don't know why they added them they they didn't do a whole lot but they were there yeah I but mean, why, there are people at the office everywhere you go where you're like why does that person work here what do they do yeah i mean sure in any given office <laughs> right, there's yeah. always like a couple of like i'm sure we have a creed where we're like what do you do <laughs> a guy in the corner i don't know if we do have a creed uh who would be our creed probably joe star joe star is our yeah. creed just come in <laughs> say a say a quick Snipe joke in. and then walk <laughs> off and you're like Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> um, but yeah, look, uh, overall, nothing is going to change my love of The Office. I don't think I like, look, I'm going to continue to watch this two times a year at least. And I'm never going to skip seasons eight and, and nine. I'm just not. There's too much good stuff. Does it work as well as like season two or three when they were just firing on every cylinder? No. But I also think like. You, you know, you don't want to romanticize it. There are some really, really bad episodes, even in, up front. I think the first season is rough. Yeah. I think season four, when they tried to do those, like, those first five were, like, supersized episodes, and they were not very good yeah. at all. Like, it's any show. You take the good with the bad, but I still think that there's good stuff in those last two. Very few shows have that many episodes I mean, cumulatively, right. and they're all great. The Office was particularly tricky, I think, because it was, I think it was doing a di- very different thing than, so if you look at Friends, for example, and if you were to look at all of those, they are, the. F- there's probably things you like more or less or places that you think it's falling apart um, a little bit or it's not working as well, but the formula is there the whole time. It's those four people, five? How many of them were there? How many, six? 
six ish ish <laughs> not my fear i mean i like friends actually but it's like those six people and their dynamics is like the thing the whole way through it gets a little tedious with the back and forth with ross and rachel and blah 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 um but with the office where it does get a little messier is it doesn't have and this is good and bad it doesn't have the formula the whole time so the messy things can sometimes lead to great surprising moments and it can sometimes just feel like a mess but i wouldn't throw out the baby with bathwater um, either. Oh, it office. sounds like 2018 Roth is much more <laughs> understanding than 2011, 2012, 2013 Roth. Well, 2011, 2012, 2013 Roth was reacting in the moment. So I was writing <laughs> reviews right after I had seen the episode. So whatever my feeling was right after I had seen the episode is what I wrote down. Um, and it was probably also like, I just also want to go to bed. I'm very tired. <laughs> this show also does to me benefit from like, if I watch one, it may be like, eh, but if I watch like six in a row and, or it's in the background, like then it starts to become a melting pot of office. And that's yeah. why I say like, I remember moments more. So look, take it or leave it. But I do think that for all of you out there, they're like, well, I'm Michael's done. I'm done. You're missing it. You're missing some good stuff. Yeah, I would agree. Some good I don't know if I'm supposed to agree with you on this show, but yeah, you can feel whatever you want to feel. Oh, good. We're just talking. I think uh, I think I would agree because the, with the hindsight of time and history and you can look at the overview. I also think there's something interesting to be learned about a show that you love when it's not working. If you're just kind of like interested in movies and television, when right. something doesn't work, you can learn just as much there as when it does. And again, like. I, any creator has my full empathy. It's hard to create a thing, yeah. anything, you know? So they did it as well as they could have given the circumstances when their entire cast was like, pace, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> I always applied things that swing for the fences, even if it misses. I think they're definitely one of my favorite shows was House but they just could not let that character grow because then the show's over. So even though it was messy, I appreciate them trying to let these characters grow, even if it didn't work. If it was like a bad haircut that grew out kind of funny. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So there we are. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Roth, for taking time to talk about the, uh, the office next week season finale because I don't want to do this over Christmas break. So I'm going to see <laughs> if I can convince uh, Dan Merle to talk the lost world Jurassic Park <laughs> with me. Uh, Cause there's some, uh, there's some Jurassic Park moments in there that I really like. And I know Dan does really not. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, please rate and review so that when you type in Billy business, I come up uh, in iTunes and not the uh, stock show that currently comes up. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you guys next week.